Good afternoon. My name is Keisha Millett. I'm a staff attorney with the Fair Chance Criminal Justice Project at the North Carolina Justice Center and want to welcome everyone to our community conversation on the war of drugs. This community conversation is a part of a series of events for the second annual Vigil for Freedom and Racial Justice. The purpose of the vigil is to highlight and address mass incarceration and state prison safety during COVID-19 and provide a public high platform, high profile platform to uplift the needs, voices and calls for help of mostly black North Carolinians in prison. Our coalition intends to remain standing in collective vigil each day from sunrise to sunset from December 1st until January 1st, 2022. To learn more about the vigil and sign on to our letter, visit the website www.decarceratenownc.com. A series of discussions on the, and um, you will also be able to find on our social media and online, a se the, our series of discussions on the impacts of the carceral system on the lives of North Carolinians. I would like to also introduce um, Two folks who will be leading today's conversation, Daquan Peters, who is an organizer um, who, out of Wilmington, and Barbara Gaskins, who has been doing work in Beaufort County, Little Washington, and Pitt County. Uh, before they begin speaking, we're going to start with a video that the Drug Policy Alliance put together on the war on drugs um, that features Jay-Z and Molly Crabapple. In 1986, when I was coming of age, Ronald Reagan doubled down on the war on drugs that had been started by Richard Nixon in 1971. Drugs were bad, fried your brain, and drug dealers were monsters, the sole reason neighborhoods and major cities were failing. No one wanted to talk about Reaganomics and the ending of social safety nets, the defunding of schools and the loss of jobs in cities across America. Young men like me who hustled became the sole villain and drug addicts lacked moral fortitude. In the 1990s, incarceration rates in the US blew up. Today we imprison more people than any other country in the world. China, Russia, Iran, Cuba. All countries we consider autocratic and repressive. Yeah, more than them. Judges' hands were tied by tough on crime laws and they were forced to hand out mandatory life sentences for simple possession and low-level drug sales. My home state of New York started this with Rockefeller laws. Then the feds made distinctions between people who sold powder cocaine and crack cocaine even though they were the same drug. Only difference is how you take it. And even though white people used and sold crack more than black people, somehow it was black people who went to prison. The media ignored actual data to this day. Crack is still talked about as a black problem. The NYPD raided our Brooklyn neighborhoods while Manhattan bankers openly used coke with impunity. The war on drugs exploded the U.S. prison population disproportionately locking away black and Latinos. Our prison population grew more than 900%. When the war on drugs began in 1971, our prison population was 200,000. Today it is over 2 million. Long after the crack era ended, we continued our war on drugs. There were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in 2014. More than 80% were for possession only. Almost half were for marijuana. People are finally talking about treating addiction to harder drugs as a health crisis. But there's no compassionate language about drug dealers. Unless, of course, we're talking about places like Colorado, whose state economy got a huge boost by the above-ground marijuana industry. A few states south in Louisiana are still handing out mandatory sentences for people who sell weed. Despite a boom in its celebrated 50 billion legal marijuana industry, most states still disproportionately hand out mandatory sentences to black and Latinos with drug cases. If you're entrepreneurial and live in one of the many states that are passing legalized laws, you may still face barriers participating in the above ground economy. Venture capitalists migrate to these states to open multi billion dollar operations, but former felons can't open a dispensary. Lots of times those felonies were drug charges, caught by poor people who sold drugs for a living, but are now prohibited from participating in one of the fastest growing economies. Got it? In states like New York, where holding marijuana is no longer grounds for arrest, 
Police issue possession citations in black and Latino neighborhoods at a far higher rate than other neighborhoods. Kids in Crown Heights are constantly stopped and ticketed for trees. Kids at dorms in Columbia, where rates of marijuana use are equal to or worse than those in the hood, are never targeted or ticketed. Rates of drug use are as high as they were when Nixon declared this so-called war in 1971. 45 years later, it's time to rethink our policies and laws. The war on drugs is an epic fail. Thank y'all so much. We'll make sure to share this video in the link as well. And I will go ahead and hand it over to Daquan Peters. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today with us. We appreciate y'all um, spending y'all time with us. Y'all could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and I appreciate it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so today we're here to discuss the um, the war on drug and build community, co continue to build community conversation around the war on drugs and its policies and how um, these policies has affected and destroyed the black community be because of the war on drugs. Um, we have someone here today, Ms. Barbara Gaskins. She's gonna also be here with me um, today. Um, would you like to introduce yourself, Ms. Barbara? Hi everyone, my name is Barbara Gaskins. Um, I am a community activist. I see my sister brothers here, Sierra, um, from Amanda Pay, and we got quite a bit of, of family here, so to speak, so I'm glad to be here. And my, my phone was freezing up, so I'm not sure if I missed out anything, Jaquan. go all the way back you know a lot of people um talk about prison reform reducing mass incarceration and 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 sentencing reform and all of these things but i like to go to the root of the, the, the issue which is um the war on drugs which escalated and fueled the, the prison system to be able to um get to the point where we are today um so this is the purpose of us having this conversation and wanting to be, have a community discussion around it because we, we, we have a visual for freedom and justice right now. You know, we, we standing outside a governor's mansion. We, um, we, we, we go on to protest at prisons. We, 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 we having all of these things and we, we still continue to ignore the conversation on war on drugs. Like it's still not going on. It's still a war on drugs. This war on drugs was a war on black people. Period point blank. Richard Nixon aide said it, you know, um, you can go all the way back to Richard Nixon aide, you know, um, you know, he, Rich, Nixon declared the war on drugs in 19, what, 71? Back in 1971, you know, um, from that point on, from him declaring that war on drugs, look at how big and how fast the prison system, the, 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 the rate, jumps most of these people that are incarcerated through the, during this period of time that raised it up to 2.3 2.4 million people were disproportionately black people african-american men in the 90s here in north carolina 90 percent of crack convictions were of black men The thing about the war on drugs is, and I always say, we as individuals who partake and uh, partook in that street economy and, and and out there in the streets hustling, once we get in a position, I remember when I went to a federal court, a part of your sentencing and federal system is to set the responsibility. You know, I used to always think set the responsibility for your acts. And if you accept the responsibility, then your, 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 your guideline levels are drop down three. If you don't accept responsibilities, then you're going to stay at your regular guideline level, which could be 360 to life. You know, so 
I used to always think like if I got to accept responsibilities and stand in the court of law and accept responsibilities for me and my, my, my actions for dealing with drugs, why doesn't America do the same thing? Because America put drugs in our community to fund a war in a whole nother country. This is what America did. Then they create scenarios and stories and movies based around their actions to be able to say, hey, this is what we did. Then they create, use the media to, to, to promote propaganda that this is where the violence is coming from because the violence and drugs go together. So they create laws and definitions based off of what they think and perceive a violent act or a violent crime is because we're dealing with drugs. All of these things that we're talking about today is born and bred with Richard Nixon's war on drugs, then Ronald Reagan, and then Bill Clinton. Um, these are the things that I would like to discuss today and have an open and honest discussion about with people that's here on this call on, on here today. Um, Ms. Barbara, do you got anything to say? I do. Um, if I could, I, I want to go back even further than um, Reaganomics to, um, you know, in 1902, and I, I have um, a lot of information that I would like to um, to share, and I'll, I'll send it out. Uh, Keisha or Laura, if I can send it to you and you can get it to everyone. So um, I had a article from the Richmond Dispatch in November 16 of 1902, in which um, it shows that whiskey was um, used by African Americans against rain and cold, um, you know, to increase their, their work. Um, but cocaine proved to be a stimulant that they uh, used instead. Um, the use grew and um, it, this became a newspaper article because uh, it, in New Orleans, um, it was saying that cocaine spread as a habit in New Orleans and other Southern cities. And it um, was found to be impossible to cure the quote unquote cocaine fiends, um, which of course black people um, and that they were being placed in asylums, killing themselves or being killed. Um, then moving forward in 1905, um, before the passage of the Food and Drug Act of um, 1906, um, in 1905, Coca-Cola uh, originally contained cocaine as an ingredient, um, but it was removed and uh, became a soft drink. Um, even moving forward from that in 19, um, in 1909, uh, the San Francisco call shows how, um, trafficking of narcotics became increasingly organized and at times were violent. And so shortly after the Smoking Opium Exclusion Act took effect. Thus, before the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1914 and the Volstead Act, it became apparent that legislation designed to limit the use and transport of psychoactive substances created unattended challenges, a growing black market for drugs that legislation was designed to control. Once again, controlling black and brown people. Um, Daquan, if I could pass it back to you. Yeah, that, I, that that's 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 something, you know, <clears throat> I, I always knew about, you know, the Coca-Cola and, and all of those type of things like that with the cocaine in it. Um, I didn't know that was happening with in New Orleans. You said, did you say in New Orleans? Hello? Was that New Orleans you said he was doing that in? With the uh using the cocaine instead of the um alcohol? Can anyone on here hear me? We can hear she uh yeah. maybe having a oh no, she just came off mute. Sorry, go ahead, Barbara. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. My my phone 
froze, so I didn't hear any of that. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> no, no I'm worries. sorry. No worries. No, uh, was that New Orleans you said they were doing that at? Yes, um, it was in New Orleans. Um, the article um, is called, it's Negro Cocaine Fiend. The use of the drug has now spread to the cotton plantation. Um, it was a Richmond dispatch, and like I said, in, ninth, in November 16th of 1902. See, and, and that's 1902. <clears throat> so, this, they, they, they've been using, utilizing cocaine forever. Bringing it amongst us and feeding it to us forever. Then we, we take and utilize it to build economy within our community. That's when they want to be able to control it. I'm just thinking about Jay-Z, what Jay-Z said in the video. Just, you know, that how he just went. And, and thinking about he just gave a, a, a timeline of my life. As a, as a black man in America, you know, who's been in and out the system, who's been dealing in drugs all his life, same like, you know, I had to I had to, to learn the hard way that, you know, that wasn't the path for me. But this war on drugs, man, we have to continue to have these conversations because this is this is where the, where, where the root of all of these bills we continue to be trying to go against and 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 they still trying to put up starts from because the same people that's in power today is the same mentality of the ones back then. The same exact ones. Ronald Reagan came in. He allowed it. Why why Nancy Reagan was saying just say no. Ronald Reagan was saying just let, let it in. Just let all the cocaine in the world in and take it to the black communities out there in California somewhere. And they spread it all the way through, all the way through the black communities all across the United States of America. Now you got the big crack epidemic. They use the media to blow that up. Then you got all these legislators making laws and stuff. I'm sorry, you can go ahead. You ready to say something? Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say, um, you know, just bringing it to today, I have a brother that is currently incarcerated. Um, he's been incarcerated uh, throughout his life. Um, he lost his mother. He lost his father. Um, his grandparents passed. And, you know, like many of us, we want to belong. So he joined the um, he joined a gang, um, you know, upon incarceration. Um, you know, there were some issues in which he needed medications for. So while incarcerated, he got all the medicine, all the pain medicine that he you know, could use, so to speak. Um, just last year, he was released. And, you know, he could not, he couldn't get Medicaid, he couldn't get any assistance whatsoever. And so, um, needless to say, he's right. You know, they, they give us pain medicine, so to speak. And when we can't get it, you know, we go to the, we go to the streets. Yeah, that, that, that's, that about sums, that, that about sums it up for us. You know, that, that about, that, that's our reality. And, and it's sad, but it's, it's real. It's sad, but it's real. And it's America's problem. America did it. Absolutely. And what I'll say, you know, when when it was the crack era, you know, um, we black and brown people were criminalized. But now moving forward, it's an opiate epidemic. It's an opiate crisis now because, you know, the the people change, so to speak. So, you know, the ones using it has changed. So now they're trying to help rather than criminalize. (laughs) 
So it's like, when do we understand that this so-called war on drugs never existed? You know, if there are substance use issues, then why aren't we trying to treat it? Why are we criminalizing? Why are we steadily criminalizing? You know, we see that um, prior to Reaganomics, prior to, you know, the war on drugs, like, apple pie, so to speak. So, uh, just there a way to criminalize us. That's 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 their whole aim and mission is is criminalizing. So I remember when I first was arrested and indicted by the federal government by the by the federal government. Um, it blew my mind when they told me that all it took for us to get you with was five grams of crack. With your record, we can get you 15 years, no doubt. I ended up getting 22 years because I was sentenced under the 100 to one crack cocaine ratio. I was under the 100, that, that law. Um, with that, what that law did was, and it tells was that five grams of crack cocaine is equivalent to 500 grams of powder cocaine. So that was saying that I'm the worstest person in the world with five grams of crack, but this white person over here got five keys of cocaine and can get the same amount of time that I can get. And he ain't no, he ain't so bad. That's what the disparity within the, 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 that law came in. On top of that, chemicals, chemical chemist has proven over the years during these times that you can't get cocaine, crack cocaine without cocaine. All you're doing is going in the store and buying baking soda and add a little baking soda to the cocaine and rocking it up. You're going to stop selling baking soda and charge you with the baking soda too? Hmm. You know what I mean? Like I was sentenced to a hundred to one crack cocaine ratio and it blew my mind. Like how can you sit here and tell me that I can have 20 grams of crack and a person can have five keys of cocaine and I get more time than him? And see, that's also what gets me about this CBD, too, because when you think about it, CBD is marijuana. It's literally a molecule taken out that makes it legal. And, you know, because we may have a, um, a charge or a conviction behind uh, marijuana, we can't, you know, we're not able to make money from it, you know it's coming into our communities it's literally you can get it on every on the well not the streets but every store you go to convenience stores and we have nothing to do with it. It, it the money is not coming back to us but if you look in the jails and the prisons most of us are in there behind you know drugs cocaine crack marijuana that just baffles me that that's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. You know, that that that's because they could control it. They can regulate it. They could tell you what they can and can't do with this. Just like I just found out what Kratom was. And I didn't know that that was another drug that people people use to get high off of. And I'm like, well, they sell it. You can walk in any store. They advertise it on, the, on, on billboards. They advertise it on the radio. They advertise it all over. It's, you could go in the store and walk in there and buy cream. But people could fail, get violated from probation for testing positive for Kratom in their system. Not only that, but Marinol. Marinol is THC. And, you know, a lot of people with HIV or AIDS uh, matter of fact, I worked in Craven County um, doing substance abuse assessment, and I had an individual 
who tested positive and we literally had to do an assessment and everything. And come to find out, you know, he had AIDS and he actually died. I did an assessment on him that Friday. He died that Saturday. And, you know, that was literally funding that went nowhere, so to speak. I mean, it, it didn't help. It, it just really took up his time, took up our time over medication that was prescribed to him. Does wow. anyone else have um, any looks input? Like Amber on... Rivero has a hand raised. Would you like to? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I didn't know if we were supposed to um, like stack or jump in or how it works with this conversation. But um, this is my first time joining any community conversation with you all. So I'm excited to uh, just be a part of this and just listen. And I'm sorry I'm late, but I wanted to say, so I just, um, I, I used to live in North Carolina when I was a youth and um, I'm also justice involved and justice impacted, right? Um, and I've been able to like, you know, thank God, turn my life around and help other people and advocate for what that looks like um, and what real reform, in my opinion, should look like, because there's a lot of progressives that are saying that they know what reform looks like, um, but they're not always centering the voices of people who are directly impacted or have experienced this before. And I think that that's significant. And a great example, in my opinion, of what you all are speaking about right now in New York recently was that we had the legislation passed where we uh, legalized recreational marijuana, right? After all these years of criminalizing um, black and brown and low income communities for not even just selling it, but even just the use of marijuana, right? So that was a huge like progress in the world of um, the war on drugs and just like redoing the, the harm, I guess, erasing the harm that was caused. But part of that legislation um, was that they were supposed to be actively finding ways to make amends for and heal the fractures and the harm that was caused to black and brown and low income communities in New York because of the overcriminalization of marijuana and the use of it and the sale of it. And so when it all actually trickled down right um, to the policy, we see less of that being implemented and encouraged, especially right on the government end. Um, and, and we were having to just really go hard about holding them accountable and educating communities and other like um, organizations, right, that were doing this work about what that was supposed to look like because it was nice when they put it in writing. And they even said that they were gonna start giving grants out to minority and women owned businesses to own dispensaries, right? And be able to legally sell marijuana and there would just be taxes and stuff on the amounts. But yet, sorry, but yet what ended up happening is that even though they said they were gonna give out grants and they were gonna encourage the ownership, right? Of these legal businesses for minorities and women, um, the cost of the upfront amount to even become licensed to own it and even be able to apply for those grants was so astronomical that they knew there was no way we were gonna be able to access it without investments from our Caucasian communities and, and, and brothers and sisters, right? That wanted to be a part of that business. So it still didn't end up helping in any way. And it still was just really nice on paper and legislation, but when it actually trickled down, um, it's just a long, long way to go and seeing the actual healing and erasure of what did happen. Thank you for mentioning that, Amber. And it kind of makes me think about uh, what we're seeing in North Carolina with um, a bill that was proposed last session, the Compassionate Care Act. And um, this was going to, allow a narrow group of folks based on certain um, identified medical conditions to be able to have, um, be able to um, use marijuana and also uh, by prescription and also allow for um, a certain a number of dispensaries, but it was a very low number, very high cost, seeing very kind of kind of similar issues that, that you've raised here. And so I think for those of us who are in the state, that's also something to look, to pay attention to as there may be a move towards legalization, what that process looks like in North Carolina um, and uh, how um, it may uh, kind of speak into what was raised by Jay-Z in the video, how there may be still risk of criminalization around marijuana, even when there is legalization, and also thinking about what, uh, uh, yeah, kind of what are the other <laughs> issues of inequity that may come up. 
Um, so just wanted to mention that. Daquan, were you going to say something? No, I was listening. I was I was actually thinking about something that uh, Barbara has said that within the, I think she said within that bill, that legislation that they were supposed to not Barbara. I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize. Amber, Amber, something Amber has said um, that they were supposed to make amends or something. You said Amber. I'm sorry. Could you could you say that again, please? Yeah, there was supposed to be a certain portion that was passed that a lot of actually minority legislators pushed for in this part of the bill was that there would be amends made and like healing of the fractures and the harm that disproportionately was caused to black and brown communities and low-income communities because of the criminalization of marijuana use and sale. So, and when I hear that, the very first thing come to my mind is dysfunction. Expunge the the, 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 the the criminal convictions that, that black and brown people got over the years due to petty marijuana charges. That that that's a one way to heal and make amends that I you know you can't give back the time that people didn't already did due to it. That's one thing you can't give back. This is why I always constantly say that the government uses time as a tool and a weapon. They know that that's one of the, that's our most valuable resource is our time, something that we can't get back. We can get all the money in the world back. We can get everything back, but we can't get that time back, man. And, and, and healing and making amends would be to release those that are incarcerated for marijuana convictions and expunge the, the criminal convictions of those who, who, who have them. Anybody got anything they want to say? Yeah, I definitely. Hey, this is Laura. I definitely think that's a start, Daquan. I think one of the things that impressed upon me from the video and, and one of the things that kind of frustrates me is that how when we think about like policy or practice change around the war on drugs, where there's this like distinction made between people who sell and people who use. And, and in, in a lot of cases, we know that, you know, same individuals might be using and might be selling to feed their habit and vice versa. And so I think that one of the things that um, we need to think about when thinking about pushing policy, especially around like compassionate care or expungement or um, funding for people to open dispensaries is like making sure that there's no carve outs made for people who have convictions on the record for manufacturing, selling, and distributing. Um, that, that's 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 a fact. That's true. So I want to I want to highlight something else that I was just thinking about in one of North Carolina um, laws that we've been fighting to get people to be able to get expunged off of their records is possession when intent to sell and deliver. That that charge to me is similar in nature to the 100 to 1 crack cocaine ratio. You know, all of those mandatory laws that the federal government have, I, I feel that North Carolina possession with a tip to say and deliver a conviction of crack cocaine, cocaine, or marijuana, or any one of those charges is, is wrong because just because a person has something individually packaged, who's, who's, to, who's to get caught with, in the, <coughs> excuse me, individual packages of drugs versus getting caught with a whole bag of drugs, white and black, white and black. Uh, uh, the chances of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, a white, young white kid getting caught with bagged up dimes of weed is slim versus a young black kid in the, in the neighborhood getting caught with 10 bags of uh, uh, weed. He, the white kid get caught with an ounce of weed. His is just one bag and one sandwich bag an ounce. This other kid over here get caught with an ounce of weed, but his individually bagged up package. Both of them are ounce of weed. Because I got mine individually packaged and he don't, I get a worse charge than he do. That possession with a tendency to deliver, I feel that's something that we got to feel that we have to do something about. Because that right there is 
what got North Carolina system the way it is when it came to the war on drugs, that possession with a tent to sell and deliver. Keisha. Yeah, okay. if I could speak on that personally, so I just, you know, um, I know I don't know any of you all, but if it's safe to say, like, I, I said I was justice involved, right? And so I ended up in New York. I always wanted to live in New York City and I knew people up there, but I ended up in New York because of situations that I experienced as an adolescent in North Carolina. Um, and so not only was I justice involved because I was an at-risk youth and I was vulnerable to become justice involved, but I was targeted for racial profiling. And, um, you know, I ended up being charged with a drug charge for someone else. Um, and my public defender wasn't the best. Um, you know, I really didn't understand the criminal justice system as a teenager. Um, my parents didn't really understand what was going on and just trusted the whole system. Uh, and, and, and that stigma and that issue followed me for so many years that I ended up just staying in New York and relocating there for a long time because at least New York City has some type of policies and, you know, uh, solutions in place for people who are formerly incarcerated to keep us, that, that, that allow us access to housing, that allow us access to a college education, that allowed us access, right, um, to jobs without having to necessarily disclose certain things up front, right? And so even though I didn't necessarily do what I was accused of, um, it doesn't really matter. What, what matters is that the system was broken, um, and I'm a prime example of getting caught up in that, and I had to actually relocate and live in a whole other state for a long, long time because I just didn't feel like I was ever going to be able to get a chance to go to college or have a career or own a house in North Carolina because of the stigmas around the war on drugs, because of the stigmas around a drug charge, because no one ever asked the questions like, did you really do it? Or what were the circumstances surrounding this? Or is the criminal justice system broken in North Carolina? Like no one asked those questions. They just saw that charge and they thought oh you're a bad person you're a criminal right um and there was no conversations back then when i first got this charge that i know of that even allowed for that conversation around environmental factors or who you know is more vulnerable for these types of situations to happen and i think that's the barrier right is like trying to get these people in legislation or that create or vote on legislation here in north carolina who have never had to experience this or be impacted by it or even live in communities that are impacted by it to understand how this is a wider picture than just criminalization and someone being bad. Man, you, you said that so good. You still in New York or North Carolina? No, I'm actually in North Carolina now. I just relocated to Greensboro. Oh, we, we, we need somebody like you on the team. <laughs> we need a lot more embers. But just to go back to saying, think about it. That's just slavery 400 years ago because all the people from the South migrated to the North because they felt like they had better opportunities to get things as Black people than they did in the South. And we just, we're just reliving it through incarceration and, and laws and war on drugs and, and things of that nature. So that's why that we have to start making sure we get people in these seats that have been involved in some type of way with the criminal justice system, have family members that's been involved that really want to turn it around because as they say, we don't have anything in place to hold these people accountable who say they're progressive and when they're on campaign saying they're gonna do A, B, C, and D. And then when they get in there, they do what they wanna do or do what the other politicians tell them to do. So we have to start making sure that we just mobilize and get the correct people in the seats. And maybe one day eventually have some way we can start holding these people accountable for the things that they're not doing. Yes, yes, yes. I, I wanna I wanna go to the chat box because I see some people putting some things in the chat box. Um Ms. Roberta Penn, um, their idea of helping is throwing money at for profit treatment centers that exploits clients and don't heal them. Ms. Roberta, you wanna speak on that? Uh, I don't think I have anything to say except that it's just the whole system around the war on drugs is so corrupted, incredibly corrupted, 
and uh, they are still arresting people and charging people here in Wilmington, particularly if they're black and they're a protester with possession of a pot pipe and actually making them go to court to deal with that. So it's just uh, from the bottom up, it's just so rotten. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Ms. Roberta. I see Laura said, um, no, hold on, Amber, do, do we just jump in if we, oh yeah, sure, Ms. Amber, yeah, anytime, anytime, but just an open discussion, we, Laura, possession with intent to sell deliver is one of the 10 most felony convictions in North Carolina, in petition, particular cocaine, right, Laura? Yes. Yes, it is. It's actually number nine. Number nine. Number nine. And then you wonder why when a lot of people don't even do crack or crack cocaine, like the thing now is fentanyl. And fentanyl comes from where? Fentanyl was a prescription that they gave you when they put you under. So that means that's coming from pharmaceutical. Like you can go on a black web and buy fentanyl from China. So why do we still have crack laws when you have stuff like fentanyl and heroin that is just taking over. I see. Yeah, you're right. Because it's, it's affecting them, 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 them uh, suburban communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, now you have a uh, heroin. I remember, I remember one, one day they, they came in the unit and told us, say, look, I want to get you a credit for RPP class. It is a uh, national heroin, heroin, heroin and opiate week. Well, they didn't had a big thing about the opioids addiction because now you're seeing more young white kids get addicted to heroin and and, and dying from fentanyl and all of these things um, because of that. One thing that I want to um, touch on right quick. But hold on, before we go, I want to, um, Keisha to show something. I see Barbara put Robinson versus Carolina, 19, I mean, California, 1962 is unconstitutional that punish, uh, to punish a defendant for drug addiction. You want to speak on that, Ms. Barbara? I do. Um, I've been um, just researching a lot of um, a lot of things regarding California. And I think if North Carolina, if we could kind of um, rally behind some of the issues that um you know california and other states pushed i truly believe that we could actually um make some of these laws fair for all of us <clears throat> and uh, that was one of the um one of the court cases yeah yeah I, I could go for california being one of those states like when i was in the feds we used to you look for case law certain case law but when we always find the good cases out of California, you know, all the good cases that we need need and looking for out of California. But for the Fourth Circuit of North Carolina ain't in, in, uh, 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 no ain't going for it. I want to because we were speaking about I heard uh, Amber say the system was broken and I had a lot of people say the system broken and you know, it, it needs to be fixed or it's, it's, it needs to be reformed. And I, I, I always tell people that the system is not broken. It's, it's, it's set in place by design. And and and, and, and Richard Nixon A, <clears throat> excuse me, said this. Look, Keisha, can you, can you show, can you share that Equal Justice Initiative? Yes, one moment. And some of you might be familiar with this interview and, and Richard Nixon A. Um, yeah, he he pretty much. But uh, but but to re, to counter this, what he said in this interview, he people was trying to say that he was a disgruntled person because he he went down and he would just want to tell on saying something about it about anything because of the Watergate scandal, you know, and, and but. The man came out and told the truth. It is plain as day. When you look at when, when you read and look at what he said, and look at where we at today and where we've been since then, it just shows and prove everything he said to be an actual fact. And I can um if folks if folks are able to open it, great. But uh I can also 
share. Let me see if I can share this. Um, I'm sorry. That's my background screen. I'm okay, having fun. And I can that was really, oh, great um, <laughs> But um yeah, I'll, I can read it out for you. Uh so it, the Nixon campaign in 1960. Okay, let me just offer some context. Um so he was interviewed, his name is um John Ehrlichman, and in a 1984, 1994 interview, um, when he was asked about the war on drugs, he said, you want to know what this was really all about? Um, he said that the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and Black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war on or the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Uh, did we, we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And um, you can see, I think you can see the details of it if you click on the um, on the link. That's under there. So, 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 being aware of this and being aware of his position at the White House, he was the domestic policy chief. This is what the domestic policy chief of Richard Nixon says. And when you look at this, everything this man said word for word is what we're going through and what we went through ever since the initiation that he did with the war on drugs. Associate, associate you know, uh, marijuana with the hippies and heroin with the blacks. Raid their homes. Break up their means. This during the same time, now, this during the same time where J. Edgar Hoover came out with the COINTEL Pro, where he specifically states that stopped the rise of a black messiah. All of these things are by design. You want to say something? Question, yeah, the question is, you know, how um, can we as activists and, you know, others um, who have been affected, like how can, or what moves can we take to dismantle this system because we're gonna it, it's gonna need to be dismantled from the bottom up exactly and and that's and that's what i'm for and that's what i'm all about anybody that know me they know that this is what i do this is what i i, I have a passion for you know i don't i don't make a lot of money doing this this work that i do you know, I, I just, this, this how real I am and for real about it because I'm, I've been, I'm direct, I'm above and beyond directly impacted. I'm, I'm, they done had, they, I've been George Floyd all my life, seeing like they done had their foot on my neck, the system they had their foot on my neck since I was 14 years old. I've been in and out the system. Absolutely. I want to take this time to do a sound bite, but I am running for District 1 um, for Congress, uh, U.S. Congress, District 1. So y'all put me in this seat and y'all think what we gonna do. Okay. All right, Ms. Barbara. Well, could I jump in really quick? Uh, Ms. Barbara, could you share your contact or your campaign contact in the um, chat if possible? Just like an email or something? Yes, I will. Okay. But what I was gonna suggest, right? And I don't know, cause like I said, I just came back to North Carolina after being gone for a long time. But um, so in New York, you know, it's the same song and dance, like, especially with the progressives, like the progressives are pretty much all we have when it comes to the reform movement. But even then it becomes, you know, a little bit of a song and dance sometimes. Right. So we had years and years and years of advocacy groups and organizations just like this. Right. Lobbying groups and everything fighting um, the halt solitary campaign. Right. And trying to end solitary confinement in Rikers and state prisons in New York and citing all of the UN's, you know, um, 
uh, findings on it, um, how it's a form of torture, how past 14 days of psychological abuse, all of that. And we finally won um, a few months ago some type of like fight, right? And then next thing you know, as soon as we get ground, um, and, and I know Eric Adams, the new incoming mayor of New York City, um, have met him before, know people that work for him and everything. And I'm happy that we have a person of color as the mayor of New York, because this is the first time in almost 20 something years that that's happened and the second time in all of New York's history. But as soon as he wins his campaign, one of the first things he comes in and says is, I'm going to bring back solitary confinement to Rikers Island completely opposite of what he would have said when he was running during his campaign and what he knows would have probably lost him some votes, especially in the black and brown community, right? Um, and, and so it saddens me to watch that same song and dance happen. Mm -hmm. And I think the only thing, right, outside of obviously like campaigns where we call our elected officials and we let them know how we feel about legislations or legislations we think they should be proposing and stuff like that collectively even if it's across the state I know I'm not probably in the same city as you guys but um but also just holding these people accountable so like you said a lot of people run on something that they think is important to certain communities to get the vote and then as soon as they get in office they relax on it or they get the pressure from the other side that doesn't want to give into that and they stop fighting for it right um that's mm -hmm. what they negotiate at the table and so it, it's accountability like how many people have you all supported endorsed or believed in before that aren't living that okay so we put out some infographics and say during his campaign he said he was going to do this but where has he delivered so that when mm -hmm. elections come up again if somebody runs against him maybe he don't get reelected right because we know that he didn't keep his word and then just dropping statistics right about what's working in other states and what has already been found right that we know that like recidivism is so high for people who don't get an opportunity to access to education while they're there or once they get back or even just access to housing and a job, you know? But it's like, why do we continue to keep that system? Because we know why. We know what the underlying issues is, but it's like, how do we become not a part of the system that exists, but use the tools and the weaponry that is used in this system to expose these things and hold them accountable on a constant basis, right? That's what we do every day. Everybody on this call, you, Sierra, Laura, Keisha, Roberta, Roberta, Miss Roberta is like, I don't want to tell Miss Roberta age, but that's a ball of fire right there. I call her Miss Rebel. <laughs> tell them, not for real. Like she just, I, I, I met Miss Roberta one time and, and I want to, you know, and this meeting was scheduled for, you know, an hour. So I want to be respectful for everybody time too. Um, we got like two minutes left, but I really want, I really appreciate everybody coming on and joining. And I really want to continue this. And, and Miss Amber, I, I, it's, it's ways that you can get involved. You know, at, like I was explaining to you, everybody on this call right here, fight against an oppressive system so hard every day. We go above and beyond to get these things done. And if I could really quick, Amber, I fully understand. And actually that's why I'm running because I am justice involved as well. You know, I have family in the justice system. And like I said, if if elected, we are gonna, we're gonna go in and we are tearing it. And that's what we wanna hear. Now, you know, that those are the things that we want to hear. Those are the things that we feel that's going to make the system. The, this is where you start at dismantling the system. You have to become a part of it to, to be to wreak havoc from the inside out. Yes, absolutely. You we got to get feet in. We well, have to get well, let me jump in because Miss Barbara ain't telling y'all everything. She needs support, y'all. She needs support. She don't have nobody to and she's trying her hardest to get people to endorse her. She ain't telling everything. So yeah. I'm going to tell it. Um, we need to get behind her and give her some support if we can, because she has no support. And we know North Carolina Democrats will tell you to run, but won't get no support behind you and let you let you fall out of the race. So we don't need well, they're that. Tell they're telling me I'm too progressive. So they're not supporting me at all because of, you know, my stance on criminal justice reform, you know, my stance on marijuana legalization. I told them I want to do a huge 420 marijuana legalization party. You don't know how many, I can't even say half of the words up here. But, but we understand. But. We definitely understand, Ms. Barbara. 
And you got some people on the call right now that's, you know, Sierra know, you know, she knows, Sierra know a lot of people. So, you know, she get you the support you need. You know, we don't, we, we, we that's what, you know, we strive to find people and deal with people in hopes that we can, you know, build relationships to be able to tear the system down. You know, hey, I appreciate everybody, man. This was this was something on a Saturday that I usually be trying to relax, but I I feel good about this. Absolutely, and look, I'm on another call. I'm in a um, training, so I had to step away from the camera on that training. But so, if nobody has anything else to say, y'all have a good weekend. I appreciate y'all. Yes. Yes, and, and always. Thank you all. You so too. Thank you for letting me, me join in today. Yes, ma'am, Miss Barbara. <clears throat> Excuse me. Keisha, right, that know. was Amber now. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining again. And uh, we know this is just the beginning and there's a lot more room to strategize around how we can move forward to address these issues. Thank you so much, Daquan and um, Barbara for joining and everyone for your contribution. Uh, stay tuned again um, to Decarcerate Now, Now NC on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter to hear about uh, other things that we have coming up. Um, we will be continuing to stay vigil until the beginning of January. Hey, and real quick, uh, Amber, you said you in Greensboro. Yeah. Sangria, we have someone for the Second Chance Alliance in the Greensboro and Charlotte area. Sangria and Omar out that way. Yeah, I'm going to hook up with her. I'm in Greensboro, too. We got some things. That okay, yeah, do. man. Y'all out, man. Listen. Oh, yeah, that's right. You is. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, you, oh, yeah. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I got you, Amber. Just hit me up. You got you. Okay, you got you I'm a done. fighter right there. Yeah, yeah y'all. We need y'all in the East. I need some help here in the East. That that's my history. Yeah, the East the East. We got to mobilize in the <laughs> east because they don't got nobody yes. else. I'm down here in Wilmington. We definitely got to mobilize y'all. It's racist out there. We got to mobilize oh, yeah. there. All right, Lord. If that's All it, right, well, y'all have a good Saturday. Y'all have a blessed weekend. Bye. Thank you for showing up, brother. <laughs>